everything we do online, every activity we take, every moment of our lives is easily accessed by companies and easily accessed by governments and is being used and exploited to both learn a lot of very sensitive information about us, but also to change our behaviors in subtle ways that we don't even realize. I'm Isha Da Vinci. This is The Grift Podcast. And that was a clip from this episode with the brilliant Nita Farahani. Nita's a pioneering futurist and leading authority at the intersection of law, ethics, and technology. She's the Robinson O. Everett Distinguished Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke Law School and founding director of Duke Science and Society. She's served on President Obama's Presidential Commission from 2010 to 2017, and she's advised the U.S. Brain Initiative and the World Economic Forum. Nita has a JD and PhD in Law and Philosophy from Duke, with degrees in genetics from Dartmouth and biology from Harvard. Her book, The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology, is an absolute must-read. In this conversation, we discuss how our brains are becoming transparent, how we're losing our mental privacy, and why we must fight for our cognitive freedom. Let's dive in and get ready for the future. I was thinking about this podcast. You were the first person I wanted to have on. So thank you so much. I am honored and flattered. So thank you. It's a pleasure to join you. You have some really interesting looking things on your wall. What is going on? So that is um, artwork by an artist by the name of Jenny Holzer. And it's called Inflammatory Essays. And she um, posted these like manifestos all over New York City uh, as installations. And a lot of it is reflecting back the power of language to us. So it'll be phrases and, um, you know, kind of statements that uh, are in, you know, headlines or everyday media or things like that. And then she will put them together into these manifestos. Many of them are not pleasant to read. Uh, They're hard and harsh in some ways. Um, Some of them are beautiful, but, you know, they're kind of beautifully displayed in these colors. It's funny because, you know, they serve as the backdrop to my office. I had them installed here pre-COVID. And because they're, you know, kind of powerful words, um, they help me think about the power of words and how to think carefully about your words and how to think carefully about the you know, kind of power of thought and language, but I have them in my private office at home. This is not my uh, office at work. And I didn't display them in other areas in our home in part because I have young children and they wouldn't understand the context of it yet. And so there'd be this kind of hard language that they would be confronted with. And then COVID hit and suddenly it became the backdrop to my life. <laughs> and, exactly. Um, I actually, I reached out to the artist, Jenny Holzer, to say, you know, hey, first of all, is is this okay? This is on my wall and it's going to become mm-hmm. the backdrop mm-hmm. of my teaching and of a lot of talks I give and things like that. Mm. And um, her, you know, agents and, and foundation responded and they said, you know, perfectly fine. And we can't imagine a kind of better setting. That's That seems like a great way to convey the power and the importance of, of Jenny Holter's work. So that's what's behind me. But, so what does it tell us about you? Well, part of it tells you that I collect art. And I, um, you know, really, so I'm a, I'm a modern minimalist. I have a modern minimalism home that we designed with an architect. I've been collecting art and mid-century furniture for decades. Um, I love finding mid-century furniture and refinishing it. I also love art that is based on text and language. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because I think there's beauty in words. There's um, beauty in language. There's also beauty in having us confront language and words and concepts in a different medium. And so mm. for me, you know, seeing the juxtaposition between the beauty of art and sometimes, you know, kind of language represented in different ways uh, helps us understand the craft of language. I'm, I'm deeply moved by words and images and art and um, think that it's so incredibly important that we really think about language and human thinking and creativity, its influence on each other, how it Mm. subtly and expressly can change how a person feels and reacts and experiences the world. Mm. And so I think it helps under, you know, it helps to understand me to know 
these are the kinds of things that I surround myself with as a reminder yeah. or the investments that I make and artists and um, that it's not, you know, my, my writing and thinking isn't one dimension of me. It represents many dimensions of who I am. It kind of goes through to the core of who I am and how I express myself and how I think about the world around. Me. Uh, well, reading the book and listening to the book as well. I loved it. Um, it's rich with story, meaning, human experience. It's funny, you know, a number of people who've read my book, they'll reflect back pieces of it, just personal stories that I included in the book about me, which just came as second nature. Um, one of the early readers of my book, who was an author himself, he was like, you know, it's so great how you inserted yourself into a lot of the writing. I didn't do that until later stages of the writing where I had to like go back and do that. And it, I, I didn't even think about that, right? It's just like the way I write, it's just interconnected with who I am. And in the same way that I was saying, like my writing is not some separate thing. Like I go to work and I write and then I come home and have a different life that, you know, kind of permeates through who I am. And so whether it's, you know, kind of telling stories about hummus that I eat when I go into modes of, you know, writing stories about my children or experiences yeah. I have watching sci-fi with them. It's just because that's how I live and think, you know, it's kind of, it, it's all integrated. And so the, the stories that I bring into the book are just because that's how I'm thinking about it. It's not like I've inserted it in there or something like that. Um, but I like that. I like that a lot of my readers have connected with me personally as a result, like, there are different pieces that really resonated with them and they feel like they understand me better through my writing and through my work, which but also I think they, is helpful. But we understand the work better because mm -hmm. a whole human being is, is, is telling us, is teaching us, is guiding us. People who have philosophy backgrounds, history backgrounds, English backgrounds, who have studied other things, really bring so much more to the tech space and law as well. We need people from diverse backgrounds in the tech space really helping to ensure that the technology that creates the future works for humans and all aspects of our humanity and is not just built out by people who are just only good at talking to computers. And, and one of the reasons that I think I just love you is look at what you've done. Law, philosophy, technology. What an intersection. So how did you end up here? You know, give us the, give us the short, there. give us the short version. I, I wish I could tell you that it was like this really thoughtful, deliberate, it, it was kind of bumbling my way there. I was, I was motivated by these bigger questions, right? I was really passionate about science and technology as a young kid, um, you know, nurtured by a father who's a physician and who, you know, had a significant passion in science. Um, and, you know, and yet I thought that the only thing you could do with that was like go to med school and be a doctor because I'm also first generation Iranian and, you know, kind of growing up with parents who are Iranian, they're doctors and they're lawyers and they're engineers. And that's kind of it. <laughs> you know, there aren't a lot of other career <laughs> paths. And so, you know, by the time I got to college, I had this, I was pre-med, but what really drove me were the bigger policy questions, the bigger ethical questions. And so I found myself consistently drawn to, you know, kind of every class that was about government and international relations and ethics and the ethical aspects of science and technology. So I took some time after college rather than going straight to med school to try to figure out who I wanted to be when I grew up. And I went into strategy consulting and I, you know, applied to every different school under the sun until I finally found my way intersection between philosophy and um, law and science. And even then, I didn't know what I was going to do with all of it. I just knew that I was really passionate about that intersection and there weren't any clear career paths to do that. So it's been sort of finding my way along the way. And I've, you know, just been incredibly fortunate to have a great academic uh, career where I've been able to explore these questions, but also have an opportunity to really engage with policymakers and companies and decision makers and translating that work because I've always been really interested not just in you know kind of philosophizing about the big issues but then translating that into what that means for 
you know, the governance of technologies and science and, uh, you know, what design should look like that aligns better with human values. And I think you're right that, you know, coming at these questions with a different background is helpful because for me, the orientation has always been about what does it mean for humanity or what does it mean about, you know, kind of how do you design things in ways that enable human flourishing versus yes. like, how do you just do it, right? How do you make it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right now, everybody's sort of talking about either you're pro-tech or you're not pro-tech or you're pro-acceleration or you're decelerationist or you're whatever. And that's, those are, those are not the questions we should be asking or thinking about. That's not the frame. Those are not the two sides of the story. In right. fact, those are irrelevant. What's important is technology can improve the world and change lives, but how and what technology and what do we need to do to ensure that whatever technology we create, and we should be, we should be going hard developing new technology, but doing it in a way that works for humans and human values. If our humanity is deleted, decreased, diminished in the process, then that exercise is flawed fundamentally because at the foundation of technological advancement should be, like you just said, human values. It's hard, you know, I think for people to come up from each of our individual issues that we're working on and focusing on, like, you know, you're trying to put food on the table, you're trying to um, do your job, you're trying to figure out what your next thing is, um, to, or you're suffering from, you know, addiction to social media, you just want to, you know, do one next thing. It's hard to step back and see a bigger picture of how all of these things are interrelated and impacting us. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm trying to do with my work is to help us like start to see the interconnection between how all of these different technologies are impacting our brains and mental experiences. And as a result, how do we start to define a space that enables us to flourish? And, you know, recognizing that everybody's dealing with different aspects of this problem makes it, I think, hard to achieve what you just said, which is to have kind of everybody reading it and everybody thinking about it, which is like, how do we, how do you build a movement around a concept that is about the human experience, right? Yes. And that's what I've been like trying to focus on is like, how do we build a movement around cognitive liberty about like fundamentally what it means to be human in the digital age and what it means to flourish as a human being in the digital age. And that's to me what kind of the crux of cognitive liberty is about. I hope we can get everybody reading and thinking about and talking about it because if we do, we start to change the demand side. We start to change the conversation. We start to say like, actually aligning technology isn't just about some X risk or some, you know, long-termist view, you know, it's not just about, even though it's also about climate and other ways in which our planet and environment are affected, it's fundamentally about the human experience and the human experience in many ways can be made better through technology. And in many ways that we're seeing right now can be made much worse through technology. And right. how do we realign things so that that much worse side starts to get better for us? 100%. I want to come back to cognitive liberty at sort of like the tail end of the our convo, because I really want us to, I want you to explain what that is so our listeners can understand why it's so important and what they can do and all of that. But let's dive into the topic that you tackle in the book. Mm -hmm. What is neurotechnology? Neurotechnology really is about technology that interacts with our brains, but that would be everything under the sun if we left it there. So it's really about sensors um, and other technology which are designed to decode, um, interpret, and change the brain. And then let's get even more precise because that still could be just about anything. Um, so it is technologies that are really focused on and designed to try to interpret brain signals, literally brain signals, um, and to try to change and affect brain signals. So a good example that's a really big neurotechnology 
is people know what an MRI machine is. There's something called a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine or an fMRI. This is a big machine that you would have your like head go into, into a tunnel. It would allow peering into inside of the brain, looking at blood flow patterns through the brain. And then AI is used to try to interpret and understand what those blood flow patterns mean. And that could be something as, um, you know, challenging as like a brain tumor, or it could be trying to translate the blood flow patterns in the brain to be about what we're thinking and feeling and imagining. And on the other end of that spectrum of neurotechnology from the big bulky machines, um, it's easiest to think about it like many people know what a heart rate sensor is now in a watch, or they're used to sensors that pick up temperature and you know skin changes from a ring that have sensors packed inside to try to pick up biometrics, changes in the body. And increasingly brain sensors primarily that pick up electrical activity in the brain are being embedded or put into different devices like headphones or earbuds or headbands. And these are tiny sensors that instead of picking up the heart rate or picking up neurons firing in the brain and patterns that collectively are called brain waves. And those are patterns of electrical firing in the brain that again, AI can be used to try to interpret what they mean. And that can be everything from a person's about to have an epileptic seizure to here's what a person is thinking because ultimately these are patterns of activity in the brain. So the difference between neurotechnology and other technologies that interact with our brains like our cell phones is that these are really designed with sensors to try to pick up specific patterns of brain activity and then using software and powerful AI to try to interpret what those patterns mean. Okay, so wearable devices on our scalps or our wrists or implantable devices that are embedded in the brain, right? Uh, some of them are embedded. So, so in, there's implanted neurotechnology and wearable neurotechnology. So implanted neurotechnology is really limited to people who have some sort of health reason, like they are paraplegic and they can no longer move, or they're suffering from an advanced neurodegenerative disease like ALS and they can no longer speak. And so electrodes are put deep into the brain to try to get the signals out when the traditional way we get our signals out is by moving our hands or speaking. When you can no longer do that, it can go directly, for example, to a computer and translate the signals in that way to allow a person to move a prosthetic arm or to send a message or move a cursor around the screen. Wearable brain sensors, instead of being inside the brain, are worn generally on the scalp. And so it might be a headband that goes across the forehead. It might be something like your AirPods, um, where in the future they may have what are called EEG electroencephalography sensors. These are brain sensors that can pick up the electrical activity in the brain, or they might be in the soft cups around headphones. And increasingly there are companies looking to put what are called EMG electromyography sensors that pick up brain activity as they go down, for example, your arm to your wrist to pick up your intention to move or to type or to swipe. And so wearables are much like, you know, the kinds of wearable devices that people are already used to, a sports watch or uh, a ring um, that pick up the biometric, the brain activity, rather than these other kinds of activities. And so they're very different classes of technology. Wearable brain sensors are targeted more at all of us. They're kind of the everyday devices. Whereas implanted neurotechnology is highly regulated and limited just to people who, you know, are severely in need of that kind of invasive technology that could enable them to uh, regain self-determination in ways that they've lost it. T tell us about the sort of scope of usage of this new technology. Like how pervasive is it at this point? And and where is it going? So I'm going to focus that primarily on the wearables. So I'd say for implanted neurotechnology, it's 
a really important and growing class of technology, but it's going to be primarily limited to people again who need it for health reasons rather than a mass market device that all of us might use. And, and you say that because it's going to be highly regulated. It's in part because it's highly regulated. It's also because the risk benefit is such that until and unless it ever gets to the place where the benefits are so worth you having something implanted in your brain, many people will decide, you know, that the the risk of infection, of brain surgery just isn't worth whatever benefit of getting kind of more throughput or output from the brain that you might achieve. So I think um both, it won't be approved for a very long time, I think, for anyone other than for uh, health reasons and for um, therapeutic reasons. And the second is because I think many people won't choose it uh, until maybe far into the future when it makes sense for people because of the benefits that they might achieve. And, you know, people like Elon Musk talk about the, you know, kind of potential future of implanted neurotechnology enabling humans to achieve capabilities that we don't have, like brain to brain communication or collectively being able to put our brains together to work on, you know, kind of super intelligence problems through collective intelligence that might enable us to compete against artificial intelligence. And I, I don't discount that that might be in our future. Uh, it may be that in the future, these technologies become safe enough and the benefit is significant enough or that the risk of not using that kind of enabling technology is high enough if we've created um, artificial intelligence for which we need those kind of additional capabilities. But I think in the near term, what's far more likely is the use of wearable neurotechnology, which isn't implanted and is instead, you know, kind of a mass market device that uh, replaces our keyboard and our mouse and becomes the way we interact with other technologies. So that's where I think there's just a huge market that's about to explode that people just are not even aware of. So, you know, if you if you think about the mass market of smartwatches, where people now are incredibly comfortable and used to having, you know, a heart rate sensor and other sensors embedded in their watch, it's kind of crazy if you think about it that there are not yet those same sensors that pick up brain activity given that is the seat of so much of what happens for our health and our well-being and just our mental experiences of living, right? Um, and if you think about the growing toll of neurological disease and disorder across the world, where overall physical health is improving, but neurological disease and disorder are getting far worse, it's still, you know, it's just stunning that there isn't that kind of parity. The market in 2020 for wearables was like 411 million of the devices were sold worth an estimated $34 billion. So that just gives you like a small sense of before the world of brain sensors, what that looks like. So there's two ways in which brain sensors, I think are gonna be a huge market that will be part of our everyday devices and will transform our experience of interacting with everything else. One is brain sensors for health, which is just like people are using heart rate sensors to track their uh, heart rate and fitness and running, having brain sensors that people can track their cognitive fitness levels, whether it's for attention or stress levels or, you know, just mental activity over the course of the day, I think will become a mass market product. But the bigger mass market, I think, is the integration of that with becoming the new way we interact with the rest of our technology. People are really used to a keyboard and a mouse. They're used to, to the extent that they've used any spatial or immersive technology, like a virtual reality headset. They might be used to like somewhat clunky hand controls or even hands being read to see how they move at, you know, as if they interact. But they're not used to being able to just naturally interact with technology the way we would right. interact with the rest of the world or interact with another human. Right. And what neural interface technology promises is replacing a keyboard or a mouse by picking up your intention to move and to swipe and to type without actually having to do any of those things, right? Think about and you, think about like and, saying a word in your mind and then just translating that onto the computer screen. We use keyboards at, or voices to interface with the computer or smartphone. And you're saying that we will now the, the new interface is a neural interface where we think the thought and the computer response, smartphone response. Yeah, here's the crudest and easiest way to think about it. Um, Apple ProVision use it, is like a 
very crude brain computer interface. It uses eye tracking technology um, and it looks at what you focus on. So you're navigating through a screen and you see like in the, on the screen in front of me right now, I see like a leave button and I see the timer going off. And so I just focus on that and I think that, and then it pushes, right? <laughs> I'm but so sorry, that's up based on like picking up that intentionality of selecting through eye tracking. And I'm sorry, it's that's creepy for a lot of people to think about, but terrifying. it's in part because, you know, think about it in, in the beginning as intentionally communicating that, right? Which is, I, I think that rather than I push a button or I have to right. navigate on a mouse to get up to a button to push the button. Right. And if you think about even just the seconds to milliseconds that that adds a friction to you doing everything, yeah. mm -hmm. the idea of neural interface technology is to pick up your intention to type or to swipe or to move and to have that be the way you interface with technology. And terrifying and terrible idea because people think bad thoughts. And at some point, somebody's gonna think a bad thought and it's gonna lead the computer doing something terrible. Just that. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the nice things about every conversation that I have with somebody about this technology, which, you know, to be clear, I think there's potentially huge upside potential of the technology if we yeah. govern it right. Yeah. Um, and I think it could be the most oppressive technology that we've ever introduced into society. And it's really about the choices that we make that I think will decide the fate of the technology. But every time you talk to somebody about it, there's some new dystopian perspective that they have on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to kind of remain in that position where I'm like, look, I can see the huge upside and I can see the huge downside because, you know, everybody sees some different aspect of the downside as well all of which is right. I mean, every one of these are potential ways in which the technology can go horribly wrong, none of which we seem to be getting out ahead of, even though we're barreling toward this. So you asked, you know, how big is it gonna be? I think it's gonna be mass market. How soon is it gonna be? Like Meta says that they're gonna launch their first EMG device, the electromyography device embedded in their watch in the first quarter of 2025. That's like a year from now, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, Apple ProVision should come out. I don't think that's going to be mass market. I think it's going to be testing the market for this kind of eye tracking technology. Apple, um, their patent that they filed to embed EEG sensors into their AirPods was recently released by the U.S. Patent Trade Office. I think that means it's you know a Imminent. year, two years yeah. until you know brain sensors are embedded into uh, their AirPods. And those are the major tech companies. Already there are, you know, tons of smaller technology yeah. companies who've already launched project products that embed brain sensors into earbuds and bra embed brain sensors into VR headsets, embed brain sensors into headbands that are worn across the forehead. The technology already exists. This isn't some futuristic technology that I'm imagining. It's already right. out there. It's already being used. It's already being misused. It's just not mass market yet. Look, I, I'm pro tech and I think we should go have fun with this stuff. And the likelihood of bad things happening, I think on this, this side of it, I think is not really the big issue. I think the really, the big issue is what you say in the book. You say that neurotechnology is making our brains transparent. You write, we are rapidly heading toward a world of brain transparency where scientists, doctors, and companies can look into our brains and minds whenever they like. I think that's mostly exactly the quote. So there are lots of benefits. We've just talked about that. Lots of benefits. No, no question. Even if it's just pure entertainment, that's good too. But this sounds like there's a massive problem. All of these devices that look into our brain record our raw neural activity or brain data. So that's where the real problem is. Yeah, I mean, Let's the real talk about problem that. is that the data, the way that personal data has been treated up until now is that it's just, you know, fair game for any technology company or any government to gain access to. And the result is that we're part of this really broad surveillance system where, you know, everything we do online, every activity we take in every moment of our lives is easily accessed by companies and easily accessed by governments and is being used and exploited to both learn a lot of very sensitive information about us, but also to change our behaviors in subtle ways that we don't even realize. Brain data is different in that it is even more sensitive. 
Um, and it is additive to all of the rest of that information. So the one part of ourselves that we hold back, the one piece of ourselves, which is how you think and feel, how you react to information that other people don't get access to and aren't privy to, suddenly is going to be made transparent to all of these companies and governments. And it doesn't have to be that way, meaning there is a world in which we could design the technology in ways that kept all of that data on device, overwrote the information on device, limited the inferences that could be drawn from the data and given to companies and gleaned by governments, but that's not the direction we're going in right now. So we're hurling ourselves toward this era of complete brain transparency, where again, the upside potential could be enormous, like having insight to your own brain activity yeah. could really reshape your own experience of self, your relationship with other people. It could be fun. It could be more seamless with other technology, but the risks are profound unless we do something about it. Okay. I want to talk about workplace surveillance where I think this kind of brain monitoring and this sort of tracking of our brain data, companies are going to think, oh, this is a great way to improve productivity and um, uh, there'll be a million reasons. Tell us about what you learned about workplace surveillance in your research and in your writing. I mean, workplace surveillance has, you know, just reached epic proportions already, whether that is um, by tracking people through cameras on factory floors to, you know, Amazon's armbands where it tracks its employees as it moves, as they move from place to place to even in um, white collar workers, especially post COVID pandemic, where uh, more than 80% of companies report to installing what's pejoratively been called bossware onto people's computers where they track keystrokes or they can't track, um, you know, the amount of time people spend sending emails or uh, on different productivity software, or even the amount of time that they're on social media, even more creepily, sometimes turning on webcams when people are working from home to, you know, take pictures of them at their desk. So that's the environment and the backdrop in which brain wearables are entering the workforce. And what I found was that already for more than a decade, that there are companies like SmartCap out of Australia that have sold um, technology into companies that enable them to track the brain activity of their employees. In that case, for the limited use case of, of trying to track their fatigue levels. And so if you imagine a commercial driver or somebody who's in mining or pilots, there's lots of software that's been designed to try to track their fatigue levels to begin with, but this is kind of going right to the source, putting a headband or something embedded into their hard hat or other, you know, kind of caps to track their brain activity. And maybe that's an okay use case. And that yeah. if, if it's just fatigue levels that you're monitoring and it's just people who are in these kind of commercial driving situations, it's hard to argue that their mental privacy is stronger than society's interest in not having them fall asleep at the wheel. But that same technology, when it's not just capturing fatigue levels, but instead what's called raw brainwave data. So yeah. it, to track one piece of information from the brain, you're recording everything that's going on in the brain at once. And then that, you know, as AI gets increasingly more sophisticated, it's being mined for much more. And so I was surprised and disappointed to see that already companies were starting to market the same kind of technology you know, earbuds or headphones to track attention levels at work and mind wandering in the workplace to try to track people's productivity to say like, well, some people pay attention for long periods of time. Some people pay attention for short periods of time, figure out which of your employees are paying attention and which of them are, you know, kind of spending their days mind wandering or not, and they're distracted. And that's a disturbing trend. Um, and you add to that trend, a lot of workplace wellness programs seemingly benign, right? Um, except that they're not governed by any of the same privacy regulations for health data. And they're increasingly being used to try to focus on mental health, all while collecting a huge amount of personal data from people's brains, which could then be used to make discriminatory choices about them. And so, you know, what I found is that there's this creepy trend that is coming toward much broader surveillance of people's literal brains at work. And it's happening, right? It's it's not just technology that is being sold. 
across China, workers are having their brain activity monitored, not just for fatigue levels, but if they're paying attention or their mind is wandering. When I was presenting this information at the World Economic Forum in Davos, a global CEO came up to me afterwards to tell me that they had already trialed on thousands of their employees across Asia, tracking brain activity. And they weren't just looking at attention and mind wandering. They were looking at boredom and engagement and productivity at home versus at work and uh, trying to use that information to make managerial level decisions about people based on what their brains revealed. So this is a trend that is coming and there are virtually no regulations that really address the collection of this kind of information. Again, against that backdrop of like massive surveillance is happening in the workplace, add to it this last piece and it just feels like you really are in the panopticon at work. Have technology will use. I mean, that's what that's what happens in these in big companies, right? They're like, okay, we can we can add this. We can right. we can use this. Let's just do it. And so what's the solution? That is just it's so when invasion of privacy, this wholesale mass scale invasion of our of our privacy and our dignity, what can a person do? This is what they're facing at work. I mean, is unfortunately the answer do? isn't really like I mean, in the beginning, it, it could be quit and go elsewhere, right? Except once everyone is doing it, where are you going to go? And a lot of the times when this kind of surveillance technology is unveiled, it's on people who don't have as much upward mobility to begin with. And so it's normalized on people who already um, are threatened with respect to being able to exercise the same rights as other people. And, you know, so so quitting, I don't think is the answer. I think the answer has to be something more societal wide. And I think that means recognizing a right that people have to mental privacy to be able to keep their brain activity data to themselves when they're at work if but, but, we were but, to recognize but, that go ahead yeah so we are we're waiting for this our, our, our legislative bodies regulatory bodies to catch up with technology mm -hmm. this is a whole other big problem which i i know you know all about as well but I'm, I'm in this company. I, I work at this company. I'm mid to upper level management. I'm, I'm invested. I spent maybe six, seven, eight years. This is my track. And then they in, introduced this, this technology ostensibly for wellness purposes. But alongside that, they're tracking me right. as an individual. I have rights. So what can I do? I must well, be able I mean, to as do an something. individual, you don't have a lot of rights. I mean, that's that's the hard truth. Other than quitting, it's hard to quit. So there's nothing I can do. In you my, can refuse, my... and and in many instances, you can mm -hmm. they can fire you. It's at will employment. Um, so you know, unless you have in one mine in Australia, there mm -hmm. were people who were represented by a union. And one of the terms in the contract of the union was that any new technology had to be approved by the union. They didn't approve the use of this technology. And so those miners weren't required to wear it. In other contexts, you know, people can join collectively with other employees and they can try to refuse or to recognize or to carve out rights. Ideally, you know, we would have, you know, we would have it happen at multiple levels. We would have rights that would be recognized as an international human right. It would not be hard to update our understanding of privacy to include mental privacy. There are five states within the United States that have biometric based laws that uh, apply to workplace settings. If you're in one of those states, you have potential rights that say, the collection of this information requires advanced disclosure, it requires limitations, it requires purpose-based limitations by employers. They can't just collect the data. You can advocate for rights. You can you know, try to advocate for a different balance. And you can certainly push for and demand to know how that data is being used and what's being collected, right? I mean, if somebody says, you have to wear these work-issued earbuds that are tracking your brain activity during the workday, you should ask for what's being collected, how's it being used, document all of it, because ideally this is going to be a rapidly evolving landscape and you should have a right to know what is being collected and how that data is being used against you. And so I think it's okay to demand those things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is a significant power imbalance between employees and employers right now. And this new technology is being introduced into really a regulatory vacuum where there aren't existing protections except in a few states that really apply. Which of those states? 
Illinois, Washington, Texas, and I'm forgetting the other two off the top of my head. Hmm. Why are you thinking about moving? <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't. I don't work for any major corporation, <laughs> and I would right. not. I would never put myself in that scenario. I was just too much of an independent person to do that ever. So, so that's so. The real answer is at a at a legislative level. We have to come up with the right solutions and include in our privacy rights. Well, we don't even have a privacy act, a digital privacy act to begin with. No, but there yeah. are some state privacy laws. I mean, look, I think it has to happen on multiple levels, right? I think yeah. employers need to recognize that they're going to quickly erode the trust of their employees and they uh, are incentivized themselves to adopt policies that actually favor employees. So I think the right answer for a manager, for a corporate leader yeah. um, is not to say, no, we're never going to adopt this technology, but it's instead to give the technology to employees to use for their own purposes and to not collect the data. Because yes. I think that the squeeze on employees will not be worth the erosion of trust, the erosion of workplace culture. I think it will fight against any value that they might otherwise realize for productivity. And so yeah. really there's there are good reasons to give it to employees to say like, look, we think that collectively stress levels are rising, or we think that there are tools that can help you to improve your attention and focus. We're going to give them to you to use where you are the only one who sees the data. We are not going to collect the data. We're not going to use it. It will not be part of your scoring. It will not be part of our decisions with respect to promotion, hiring, or firing. We're doing it for your benefit. They'll see the benefits of it in the workplace if their employees use it. They'll also see the benefits of the improved trust between employee and employer and the cultivation of a better workplace environment and better morale. That overall leads to increases in productivity, increase in overall benefits for the, but putting a surveillance system in place where you're monitoring brain activity, not only are you not going to see much benefit from that, you're also going to see a lot of detriment to the workplace. So I think yeah. we should expect employers to make sensible choices in this regard yeah. to use the technology to empower employees, not to further disempower them. Yeah. And I think that everybody's interest aligns in that way. Yeah. We also should encourage commercial entities who are developing these technologies to think about the people who are using them and to align them for human values. And by that, yeah. it could be things like, you know, so assume that the earbuds I have in right now could both track my brain activity and allow me to record a podcast and listen to music. Yeah. I should have an on off switch, right? And that on off switch should be like, I don't want the brain sensors tracking my brain activity while I'm doing this podcast. This is a time where I don't want it to be like multifunctional. And these multifunctional yeah. devices should have user level controls that allow yeah. people, if they're using work issued devices at home, which a lot of people do, right? A lot of people get yeah. a computer or a cell phone or other devices that are issued by work, and then they take them home and they use them at home as well. When that happens, they should have the capability of turning off tracking yeah. features and the at home. And so commercial design needs to do that. And yeah. then we also need rights, right? And so I don't think that the only answer is like, let's wait for all the legislators to wake up and do something sensible. I think it's, let's encourage everybody to do sensible things and to do things that actually align with human values. And by doing those things, I think commercial device manufacturers will enjoy increased trust and increased uptake of the products. I think that employers will see a flourishing workplace. And I think that governments can also play an important role to serve as a kind of check and balance in this regard. But we need everybody across the ecosystem to be working kind of in harmony to do this collectively for the collective good. I think that is the smartest thing because it's not the either or, but it's finding that third point where the interests of all parties align and we can actually make progress that, yeah. that supports, that bolsters, empowers um, human values and human needs and human performance. Sure. We want to, we want to perform at higher levels. We do. And if we could have technology that supports that, that's great but not at the expense of our privacy. So let's make let's make technology that um, protects our privacy, that respects our privacy, that values our privacy. Not hard, right? Not a hard design choice to make. Right. Along those lines, we have the government. You write that governments across the globe are investing in developing brain biometric measurements. And you say that 
Our brain is so unique, it can be used to identify you. It's the latest form of biometric data. Tell, tell us about that and what you learned about how governments are sort of using this neural data and what are the positives and negatives of that kind of, uh, I don't know, surveillance. <laughs> so look, I think many people are used to, uh, we all are used to how annoying it is to have passwords, right? Yeah. To try to, like, I, you know, I have a different password after, for every single site I interact with and I forget them and I have to reset my password all the time and their password breaches all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So biometrics has become an important um, alternative that many companies and governments have invested in to try to create secure ways of accessing information or authenticating people. And right. that's, you know, using your face ID to unlock your cell phone or walking to get onto a plane. Recently, I could just stand in front of a camera and they don't need my boarding pass and they don't need my ID. They just do facial recognition, which is, you know, kind of creepy. But at the same time, that's what people are using is, is that's where we're headed. Yeah. Yeah, that is where we're headed. So, so it turns out that functional biometrics are more secure. And functional is, you know, if you think about um, when people use a pattern of how they unlock their cell phone, it's how they move their finger that's being tracked rather than necessarily the numbers that, you know, kind of authenticate somebody. Um, and brains offer what might be kind of the perfect functional biometric in that how your brain processes information may be unique to you. Um, and it's possible to record it. So imagine this, you like think of your favorite song. And now think of like a line from that favorite song. And so you sing that little song in your head while your brain activity is being recorded. And that becomes your password. So then you walk up and, you know, it says authenticate yourself and you sing that little song in your head. And that signature of how you sing that little song in your head is the functional biometric. It's hidden. It's invisible. It's very difficult for somebody else to spoof. And if somebody somehow copies it, you just change to a different song. And the way you sing that different song is the kind of unique neural signature. Right now, this hasn't been done at scale to know if every single person has a unique neural signature. But across the studies that have done this, it's possible to uh, authenticate rather than identify. So identify means I could pick out every single person on the globe and have a unique neural signature. Authenticate means I record my favorite song and then I, you know, sing my favorite song again in my head and you try to match those things together. That's authentication. Right. The governments are investing in brain biometrics for authentication. Um, and so far... Uh, it has not been, you know, launched at scale. I haven't gone through an airport yet where they've asked me to sing a little song in my head, which is good because they're not picking up my brain activity. Right. But I think in the world in which we're using neural interface to interact with all of the rest of our technology, it's not hard to imagine the next step on that, which is you unlock your mobile phone and your computer by singing a little song in your head, which is picking up your neural activity from your neural interface device. Right. Oh, so, so that sounds super sexy and super cool. But infrastructurally, our technology is flawed because on the front end, you're having a super sexy experience. But on the back end, no matter what, somebody else has access to your most sensitive, most private, most personal data. And right. with advances, massive advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence, one can only imagine what they could do with that, a, a bad actor, a, a, a totalitarian government or some some body or institution that has some agenda or some vendetta against the private individual, that person right. could lose every possible uh, avenue for. That's right. So, I mean, I think the challenge is maybe the biometric itself is not the problem. It's the giving access to the brain data that's the problem. So in order right. to be able to unlock my phone or my cell, uh, you know, my cell phone or my computer or to board a plane, I have to give access to my brain activity. And yeah. once, once that becomes the way in which you have to authenticate yourself, yeah. suddenly 
other people have a right to access that information. And so now how does that get misused? We've just been talking about decoding rather than even writing. And we can stay in that realm for now, right? Where yeah. most of these devices for now are read devices rather than write devices. Write devices right. are also coming. But mm -hmm. read devices, like it turns out how your brain reacts to information is something you don't have a lot of control over too. So, um, you know, there mm. are uh, reports out of China of using the fact that workers are wearing these brain sensing technologies to then flash up, for example, communist messaging and see how the brain reacts to that information. Do they react positively? Do they react negatively to it? When you're in a society in which even your very thoughts are being monitored for you know, adherence to a political ideology or belief, um, it's possible to probe a person's brain for a lot of information. Researchers have reported trying to embed subliminal messaging into a gaming environment that a person is using brain mm -hmm. um, computer interface technology or this kind of brain mm -hmm. wearable technology. And they've been able to accurately figure out what a person's PIN number is and what their home address is. And so it's possible without you even being aware of it, once your brain is an open book yeah. for your brain to be queried without your conscious awareness or processing of information, which means, you know, kind of all of the secrets you hide in your brain from the biases you hold to the secret crush you have to trying to figure out what your, you know, sexual orientation is to trying to grapple with your own gender identity, all of those things that you may not choose to share yet with other people or ever with other people could be queried and revealed without your realizing it and without you consenting to it or wanting that to happen. And so I think people just aren't prepared for a world of brain transparency where, you know, their brains are an open book. When I hike, I, I listen, that's a great time for me to like listen to a book. So I'm out there in the trails here in LA and I'm listening to this book. And one of the things that really struck me was your brain, your relationship with your brain, your inner self is so foundational and core to being human, like that private aspect of who you are. And you talk about in the book, like what you share with another person, what you don't share with that other person. It's central to our sense of self, our identity, who we are. It's, it's so core. And if we lose that, will we lose our humanity? If we allow other forces into our relationship with ourself, what will that do to our core identity? I think really... those are the right questions to be asking, right? And and I don't have the perfect answer to that. I think we won't know, Ooh. right? Um, we don't know if, you know, this era of complete transparency will lead to a new way of relating to each other and we'll learn some different way uh, or if it will so fundamentally undo the human experience that it yeah. undermines human flourishing. What do you guess? My guess is our relationship with ourself is fundamental and should not be invaded. I, or I, I believe with. that for, I believe that mental privacy is foundational to humanity. I think it yeah. is you know, it's, it's hard to, it's not that I can't imagine that there will be a world in which humans will exist, where they will relate to one another in that world. It's hard for me to imagine people flourishing in that world. Um, exactly. So that's, that's the difference. And, yeah. and so I think, exactly. yeah. And if you think about it, if you think about it, fascism, Nazism, cults, um, they all have to do with brainwashing people into right. a belief system that we want to impose on them. And when that person gives up that that the right to their brain and, and hands it over, abdicates their own self-determination, their own control of what they think and what they believe and hand it over to somebody else, then bad things start happening super fast. Yeah. I mean, I think that the risk of conformity, the risk of self-censorship, the um, you know, inability to to ruminate, to engage in metacognition mm. and to figure out who you are, to decide and to make yourself a better person, right? I mean, many of our biases are biases that were, were you know, kind of culturally uh, imbued with growing up, right? We don't, we don't choose many of those biases. But as we grow, we choose 
to counteract them. We choose to work on them, to metacognate and to improve ourselves. Yeah. Um, we engage actively in, you know, trying to figure out who we are, to dream, to work out a crush we may have on another person, to, you know, play with an idea, dream a dream of freedom in an oppressive society. All of this happens internally. Mm -hmm. And we we choose when and how to share Intimacy between people is about how much you choose to share with another person yeah. and who you choose to share it with. And when all of that gets upended, it, it's it's hard to imagine humans becoming fully self-actualized beings. Yes. And that's what I worry about is like, yes. like we're, we spend all of our time in, in self-censorship rather than self-actualization. Yeah, yeah. In the book you write, our brains need special protections. If they can be hacked and tracked like all our other online activities and cell phone calls, if our brains are just as subject to data tracking and aggregation as our financial records and online shopping, then we are on the cusp of something profoundly dangerous. Let's talk about our mental privacy and what that means and why it's important. And then I want us to talk about cog this concept of cognitive liberty. So... Mental privacy to me is one aspect of cognitive liberty. Cognitive liberty is the right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. It is, I think, the updated concept of liberty that's missing in our conversations today, where people, you know, talk a lot about and think a lot about liberty, and they have presumed and assumed that they have cognitive liberty. So what does cognitive liberty include? Mm. It includes both a right to access and change information about our own brains if we choose to do so, but a right from interference with our mental privacy. And um, that interference is about mental privacy and freedom of thought. And so mental privacy it. to me is one piece of the landscape of cognitive liberty. Cognitive it's the liberty. it's the right from piece of it, just yeah. like there's the right to piece of it. Um, it. And, and mental privacy, I differentiate from freedom of thought because freedom of thought is an absolute human right. It is the right against interference, manipulation, and punishment for our thoughts. But because yeah. it's such a strong right, I think we have to define that narrowly. I think we yes. have to say, like, this is just about, like, the kind of metacognition, the the images and robust thoughts in your mind. Whereas mental right. privacy, you know, it's what we've been talking about, where your subconscious responds to stimuli, right? Yeah. You have like, you're not thinking it's just your brain has all of these memories and information and biases and everything baked into it. And it can be made to react and reveal a lot about you. Mental privacy covers all of that. It covers, you know, your affective, your cognitive, your cognitive states from being accessed and interfered with but it's a relative right. All privacy rights are relative rights. So we were talking mm. earlier about the possibility of tracking, for example, fatigue levels for a commercial driver. Mm -hmm. That violates a person's mental privacy. Right. But, but maybe that's okay, right? Me meaning like, well, right. Yeah. But you would find the right balance. Like the only thing you would track would be fatigue levels. You wouldn't track any other information if right. you exactly. were trying to balance it, right? So, yeah. So it's it gives you a framework by which you understand how to balance the intrusion into a person's mental privacy against the societal interest that would be the countervailing interests. Exactly. Okay, so we're entering, based on your work and what you've written, we're entering a phase of human existence where the right to cognitive liberty is something that needs to be encoded. Right. So I think, I mean, I think in the book, and the paperback edition is coming out soon. So there's an afterword that I've been working on to try to ah. show how the um, right to cognitive liberty expands well beyond the human rights framework. Right. So in the book, I really outlined the human rights framework, which is to say yeah. the right to cognitive liberty needs to, as a starting place, be recognized as an international human right. It gives us the yeah. framework by which we understand how to update our existing interpretation and understanding of three interrelated rights, mm -hmm. which is the right to self-determination, the right to privacy to include the right to mental privacy and the right mm -hmm. to freedom of thought to also protect us beyond freedom of religion and belief against interception, manipulation, and punishment of our thoughts. And I, I think that is the right starting place because in order to change the terms of service of technology, in order mm -hmm. to really put it in favor and to put people in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. we have to have an international both legal and global norm that helps reframe the conversation. 
Yeah. But I don't think you can stop there. I think beyond rights in the ways that we were talking about it in the employment setting, it's a shared framework for how we update technology and our interaction with it in the digital era. So that means yeah. rethinking what commercial design means from the ground up to favor yeah. cognitive liberty. And that's everything from user level controls to in a world of AI, having badges when you know you're interacting with AI so that you're safeguarded against manipulation to having content authentication and provenance to help us, you know, secure our freedom of thought. It means really investing in society and the research that we need to try to figure out what are the ways in which technology is both harming cognitive liberty and how do we enable it to flourish. Right. Yeah. It also means really aligning incentives in society, right? So we yes. were talking about how like when employers incentives and employees incentives are aligned, where overall everybody is better off if you give the technology to the employees to use without tracking them. Yeah. We need that same sort of alignment of incentives. And unfortunately, tech companies, like major tech companies incentives right now are extractive. They're about trying to addict us and keep our attention, which erodes cognitive liberty. It doesn't enhance it. And yeah. we had this with legacy energy companies where energy companies didn't have incentives to invest in alternative energy. And we needed massive governmental incentive programs mm -hmm. to start to shift their incentives to have it be aligned toward investment in alternative energy. Yeah. We need the same thing to happen with legacy tech companies. We need legacy tech companies to have incentives, massive incentives that encourage them to realign their products away from extractive and exploitative to cognitive liberty. And I think yeah. we only get there through an ecosystem that's about rights, commercial design, alignment of incentives, and then giving consumers the power, the tools, and the education they need to advocate for their own cognitive liberty. I want to talk a little bit about the future. You're a parent, you have young girls. How, how are you preparing them for the very different future ahead with all of these new technologies? So I'm not somebody to ban technology at home or ban screens at home. I think screens are part of their future, but I am trying to educate them um, about the healthy use of screens, at least as I interpret it, right? We all have a different interpretation as to what that means. So that means active rather than passive participation if they're using screens. Um, that means uh, teaching them what addiction means and uh, trying to help them to understand it. So almost nine-year-old uh, has really begged for a long time to play Roblox. And against, uh, you know, my husband's objection, we finally, you know, agreed to a limited use of Roblox with like every parental control turned on. <laughs> and, you know, the, the challenge is like, we'll give her a timer and we'll say, okay, you get 30 minutes and she has a friend that she has, uh, like friended who's one of her classmates at school and they'll they'll play a game with each other. And then at the end of the 30 minutes, the timer will go off and they'll be in the middle of the game. And, you know, we'll say, can you push pause? Can you do something to like extract yourself? No, I just, I have to finish the game or I have to do this thing. Sorry, the timer's up. You have to put the game down. And then we talk about that. We talk about mm. the feeling of urgency, the, like what the, you know, reward motivation system is that it's trying to hack into. We talk about the brain and what its impact is and try to help her have insights into what the technology is designed to do and why she feels the way she does to try to develop the introspection and interoceptive skills that she needs to coexist and co-evolve with technology. Mm. Those are conversations that we're going to kind of continue to have is mm. to try to empower her to understand the impact of technology on her her, her well-being, yeah. her thinking, her experiences, et cetera. And, you know, that's kind of the best we can do is to try to stay on top of the research, try to educate them and try to empower them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Beautifully said. So every episode, Nita, I ask my guests to give listeners one thing to do that will help them to get ready for the future. Based on your expertise and your understanding, your experience, what would your one thing be? So I'm going to give them do? a hard one. So there's mm. a word that a lot of people don't know, which is interoception. They've heard of introspection, but not interoception. Mm -hmm. Interoception is a bodily sense. It's your ability to have a sense of your own thinking and feeling. 
Um, and it requires like meditation, mindfulness, even the use of technology that helps reveal to you your own body. I'll give an example of it. I was traveling a lot recently and I thought when I got home from a trip that I was short of breath. Um, and I was like, I don't know what it is, what's going on, but I'm like, I'm having a hard time catching my breath. So I got a pulse oximeter out and I checked and I was wrong. I was at like 99%. I was not short of breath. And so I spent some time really trying to be like, what am I experiencing? And I realized it was just overwhelming fatigue and exhaustion. Mm. Interoceptive capabilities, a sense of your own thinking and feeling and getting in touch with your own body is what enables you when you're interacting with technology to start to understand how the technology is affecting how you think and how you feel. It's the foundational skill you need to ultimately safeguard yourself against manipulation and the kind of problems of addiction that arise from technology. But unless you cultivate and hone your interoceptive capabilities, you're not grounded in your own body and your own thinking and your own self to be able to navigate what is a very rapidly evolving world where technology can in some ways overwrite that unless you are in touch with it and make it be overwritten without even being aware of it. That is, wow. And how would they, what are some ways that someone can expand their level of interoception? So the, the kind of best is to just take five minutes of mindfulness a day to just literally like internally try to say, what am I thinking and feeling? you know, like wiggle your toes all the way up to your head and feel it internally to understand what it feels like. Start to check your own feelings. Like if you're feeling overwhelmed, like I am at the moment when I thought I was short of breath, use some sort of external device, check a pulse oximeter, but it's trying to both internally get a sense of self by being in touch with your body, which is not that hard to do. It's just very few people sit still for five minutes long enough to look inward and to truly say, how am I feeling? Am I aware of the pain in my shoulders from slouching over the desk all day? Am I aware of the tension in the back of my neck? Am I aware of, you know, what my toes feel like and my, my legs feel like? People ignore their bodies and their sense of self and their own thinking and feeling. And all it takes is about five minutes a day to start to strengthen that muscle. Is there anything else you would like to say? Is there anything I should have asked you or anything else no, you'd like to say? I mean, say? I'll, I'll just, you know, one of the things I'll say is, mm -hmm. or the last thing I'll say is mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, tend to think a lot of my work is in some ways very dystopian. In some Not ways it all. is. Right? I don't think well, so. Well, in some ways, you know, I'm painting a picture of a future that could be very dystopian. But I'm actually very optimistic. Solutions. You're, I, wait, that's what I'm hoping. You're, you're presented a, a, a whole legal position on cognitive liberty, the right to cognitive liberty. This is massive. This is hardly dystopian. Well, I mean, so I, so I, so I, I'm glad you see that. And I just want your listeners to know that, like, I actually think there is a pathway forward. I just think we need to work toward that pathway together and realize the urgency of doing so. And if we do that, I really do believe that the collective future could be a hopeful and a positive one, but we can't let the decisions just fall into place the way that they have until now. We have to actually move to secure a right to cognitive liberty to enable that bright future. Okay, folks, get the book, follow Nita's groundbreaking work on social media. You will find all the necessary links in the description below. Nita Farahani, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts and on our YouTube channel.